Are you strapped in, my friends? Because we're about to go on an adventure that, to be real, I'm still pinching myself over. The moment has arrived and I'm dropping the very first interview on the Humanity Archive podcast. Cue the confetti. I don't have any confetti, but no, this is not just any interview. I've roped in my friend Sharon McMahon to kick things off. And if you don't know Sharon, you're in for a treat. She's not just an author. She's not just a podcast host or an influencer. She is full of knowledge, a former teacher of government. She reaches millions daily with her insights on politics and history. And this conversation, it's not just important, it is vital because it's not a stretch to say that knowledge is power. We talk about that. It's not a stretch to say that we should know the power of small actions and how they have made waves throughout history. We talk about that. It's not a stretch to say that our lives are political, whether we claim to be engaged in politics or not. It's not a stretch to say that so many people wonder if their online dialogue is really making an impact. It's not a stretch to say that you, yes, you out there can make an impact. We talk about all that in this episode. And just when you think it can't get any more gripping, Sharon pulls out some stories about Richard Nixon and Abraham Lincoln that I'd never heard before. So trust me, these are things that you won't want to miss. And if this episode speaks to you, if it stirs something within you, do us both a favor, hit the subscribe button, smash the like, and help us spread the word. The bigger we grow, the more monumental conversations I can have and bring to your ears. So without further ado, let's dive into the episode. Enjoy the ride. I am here now with the great Sharon McMahon. I'm so glad to have you on the Humanity Archive podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show, Sharon. Pleasure. So happy to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. I, I really appreciate you. I appreciate your content. I've been a huge fan of your work for a long time and the way that you frame your content around this kind of non nonpartisan government informing of the public and engaging of the public in such a way where people can come together and actually have a dialogue. And that really resonated with me because I, I kind of see myself in that, right? The content that I put out, I really no matter what I'm talking about, my end goal is to always connect to the humanity of whoever it is out there. So you've kind of had this fascinating and amazing rise in your career. You have this transition where you went from teaching. At one point, I think you're kind of posting family photos and inspirational quotes on your Instagram. And then you kind of have this viral success and it turns into this huge brand as America's government teacher, Webby Awards for your podcast. You have this great philanthropy, which I want to get into later. And I just kind of want to know what was that like for you? What were the moments of self-doubt or fear? Like, how did you navigate from your career as a teacher to where you are now? Well, thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. And I just want to say that I really appreciate your content too. I mean, we met on Instagram because I uh, I don't even remember who found whom first, but I have appreciated your content for a long time as well. And I really love seeing what you have to post. And I regularly learn things from you. And I direct people to your account all the time. And I just really love the work that you're doing. So kudos to you, first of all. Uh, and by the Thank way, you. I don't know if the general public is aware of exactly how much work goes into producing content like the type you make, uh, but it is extremely labor intensive. People just think like, oh, yeah, it's like a picture and a paragraph. The the hell it is. You know what I mean? Like it is extremely labor intensive to produce quality content, which is why most people are posting about, you know, celebrity fashion. Or, you know, just Absolutely. gotcha journalism. It is extremely labor intensive. So I want to tell you that I um, I see how much work you put into your content. And I want other people to know that it is extraordinarily labor intensive, the vast majority of which is unpaid. You're creating a tremendous amount of free value for the general public. And I see it and I, I know exactly how much work it is. So I appreciate you. I appreciate the work that you're doing. And I know I benefit from it. I'm better for it. And I know others are too. So kudos to you. Um, in terms yeah, of thank you. 
Yeah. Oh, it's truly. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I mean it sincerely. It's a lot of work. And this podcast is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to interview people, and it's a lot of work to produce the narrative episodes that you produce. It's a lot of work to write a book. Like all of this is a tremendous amount of labor that the average person has no idea how much work goes into it. Yeah, it's a labor of love, though, isn't it? I mean, if I didn't love what I do, it would be very difficult to uh, mm -hmm. put the hours in. You know, behind the scenes, I think that people only see the surface. They only see what you put out. They don't see the hours that goes into it. They don't see, mm -hmm. uh, as we were talking about before with my book, uh, you know, I wrote, uh, you know, a 400 some odd page book in 10 months. I mean, I've got just books all around me. I've got hours put in. And, you know, I, I definitely love talking to someone like you who knows what that's like, who appreciates that. Not only putting out the content, but then trying to engage and make connections mm -hmm. with your audience, with your fans, trying to engage in true, real dialogue with people mm -hmm. and make an impact. So, uh, you know, that's mm -hmm. what I'm about. It's not about uh, value and money for me or anything like that. It's about value and connections and a legacy of uh, informing people and giving people wisdom and knowledge that can enrich their lives and hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, transform the world in some way. I love that. I love that. I know we've spoken before about our shared love of libraries, and I know that I would I would not be who I was today had I not had uh, free access to the public library that was near my house, had my parents not been like, yeah, go hang out at the library, please do. Um, you know, my parents were not, we, we didn't have money when I was growing up. My dad was, my mom stayed home and my dad was a you know, worked in the trades. And there were times when my parents were on public assistance and we loved to read at my house, but they didn't have money to take me to Barnes and Noble and buy 10 books a week. But I could definitely walk to the library and check out as many as I could carry home. Or some when I got older, I would take the bus to the bigger main public library and spend all afternoon there and come home with a backpack that I could barely, you know, like the bus stop was several blocks from my house and like, you know, almost, I, I basically needed like a small hand cart to pull behind me, you know, to like carry all the books home. <laughs> like, oh, I know it's going to be a slog to get up the hill to my house. Uh, and I know that the public library was really, really instrumental and transformative. Um, in your life too. So the groundwork for, I think, both what we both do is free access to the public library. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, how, how do you think that the library or what connections can you make? I mean, I, I would think that the curiosity of <laughs> going after information, fact finding that has to have some kind of connection to those days where a young Sharon was uh, dragging that cart around full of, mm -hmm. full of books, right? So how, how do you think that mm -hmm. connects to what you do now? Mm. I, I, I love the that you brought up curiosity because that's what the library lets you have. When you go to buy books, when your money is on the line, you have to be a lot more sure of your purchase, right? You have to think, I definitely want to read this. Or even if you're being, uh, you know, even if it's wishful thinking, you think you want, you aspire to be the person who would read this book. Uh, you want to be the person that has it on your shelf or at the coffee table. Whereas with the library, there is much more ability to just follow a whim and to go down a rabbit hole that you didn't even realize you were interested in because it's free to yes. take the books home. And then when you go home, I did this so many times I can't even count. I would flip through the books and find the sections that interested me. And I would read those sections, but I never felt the pressure to, I must read every single word of this book because I have to get the value for my money. If the book ultimately only had a few pages or a few pictures that was interesting to me, I still found that to be valuable. And all all of that created this repository, this storehouse of knowledge that builds on each other, that begins when you are young and you are, you know, your your brain is still very malleable and mm -hmm. you learn how to make these kinds of connections of like, oh, I remember that from this other thing that I was reading. And it, I mean, I can't tell you how many tangents I went on at the public yeah. library. That went, it That's ranged from part. like, yeah, exactly. Ranged from like, oh, you know what? Wilderness first aid. That is, how, 
How do you, like, if you get pinned under a boulder, how do you live through that? You know, like, am I going to go buy a book on wilderness first aid when I'm 11? No. But it was just a topic that was, like, even remotely interesting. And I remember checking out all these books on first aid, why that was a topic for me. I don't know. I don't work in any kind of medical field. I could (laughs) tell you how to apply a tourniquet, though. If your arms, if your yeah. arms trapped under a boulder, you know the the the, li- the list of topics that I just went on random tangents of. Um, I'm not even necessarily using all of that knowledge today, but it it lays the foundation for inquiry and connections and being able to see, like what you do, being able to see how all of humanity uh, is linked throughout time and space in these really, really interesting ways and uncovering those connections between uh, people in history, that ended up being one of the topics that I found the most interesting. Did you know that this person knew that person? You know, like, don't you love those kinds of connections where you're like, this person knew that person in history? Because that's not how it's often presented in history books. It's kind of like the real life Easter eggs, right? When you watch a movie mm-hmm. and you're kind of like looking in like, oh my God, that connection there, right? So there's so mm-hmm. many stories like that or um, things that overlap. And like you said, it's it's really is about finding connections. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you go in a library, it's kind of like you're a detective. You're searching, you're seeking, there's a fun to it. And uh, uh, it's curiosity fuel the libraries. It was kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, I just turned 40, but I mean, so the, internet wasn't so much of a thing it was kind of coming into play but not like it is now so it it was almost like getting dropped into the internet except everything's organized Mm -hmm. so you could like you said go down those rabbit holes you can get lost in the aisles you could learn anything you want and Mm -hmm. you know that's that's definitely influenced my work as far as Mm -hmm. this and the the foundation of it all it's curiosity right it's not what you know but what you're willing to learn and even humility to want to learn more to Mm -hmm. say that i don't know as much as i think i know so i can always go seeking and finding knowledge and i think that applies to to any field right whether you you know want to learn about how to put a tourniquet on or whether you're trying to learn about the government and how it operates Mm -hmm. and you know what you can do to uh you know try to affect change in the world and so Mm -hmm. definitely you know for you I'm, i'm very interested to know again like how you know, where did this interest in government come from? Mm-hmm. And, you know, this transition for you in terms of, you know, out of that teaching career, uh, you know, into this more public landscape, you know, where you have all these followers and, you know, what that responsibility feels like, you know, what, uh, you know, are your feelings of any feelings of self-doubt? Are you mm-hmm. just super confident getting on there? Because one thing I like about your content is that you're very vulnerable, right? You're on there putting on your makeup you're just kind of kicking it with the with the people right and um i think that's what really resonates with people from your content right they feel like they're just in the in the living room with you just having a conversation with one of their friends and i think that's how you've been able to build this very robust community of of governors as you call them so you know just tell me about that transition and what that felt like for you was it overwhelming did you ever have any you know imposter syndrome or you know what what has that been like mm. Well, my interest in government really started when I was about 12. And again, I mentioned that my parents were not well off. And so I got a paper route and I wanted to make my own money. And at the time, like my local newspaper would pay a 12 year old to do that. And I made $72 a month, which is a lot, still a lot of money for a 12 year old. You know, like, do you give your 12 year old a $72 a month allowance? No. Uh, But I worked for it. You know what I mean? I got up at five o'clock in the cold Minnesota freezing winter and walked a couple miles delivering newspapers. Well, this was before phones. And there's literally nothing else to do except surreptitiously read the newspaper. So I would, you know, like you couldn't let the people that you were delivering the paper to know that you had read their paper. You had to like carefully refold it and, you know, and get it ready to be put in their front door. So I started just reading the newspaper and that, that, you know, local events, current events, things like that started becoming interesting to me. When I got to be a teenager, I did a ton of babysitting and I saved my babysitting money to buy a subscription to Newsweek magazine. 
And again, it was just interesting to me. Current events became very interesting to me. And we started getting Newsweek in the mail. And my mom was like, what the heck is Newsweek? You know, like, why would we get this? My parents were not politically active people. I mean, they definitely voted, but they were not people who were like, we need to, we need to, you know, attend this thing or subscribe to that. That was just not what they were interested in. So I, uh, but I didn't tell my parents that I had purchased this Newsweek subscription until it started arriving. And I think my parents were like, okay, I guess it could be worse. It could be worse than your 15-year-old subscribing to Newsweek. So I continued getting Newsweek for a long time. And um, I, you know, sent in the little card, ch- changing my address when I would move to a new place in college. And I remember when I finally graduated from college and got a job, um, I was making $26,000 as a teacher. Um, but somehow I found it in my budget to start paying for a subscription to two magazines, two periodicals that I had loved for a long time, but were very expensive. So I would I would check them out of the library, but you can only check out past issues. You can't check out the current issues. So I always coveted uh, The Economist and Foreign Affairs or Foreign Policy magazine. Like those are, those were like, oh, but it's like $72. You know, like it yeah. was so much money. Not cheap. Uh, so when I finally graduated from college, I started getting, you know, even more magazines delivered to my house because I was interested in these topics. Um, and then when I started teaching, I, my very first teaching job where I was making $26,000 a year was with, in a program for students who had chronic truancy and delinquency issues. They were children who were involved with the criminal justice system. And most teachers would not, you know, like that's a job that you like try to get out of as quickly as possible. Yes. Um, That ended up being a student population that I loved working with. Um, Students who had struggled in school for whatever reason. They, there's a huge variety of reasons why students have trouble coming to school, uh, have trouble with law enforcement, and have trouble succeeding in school. Uh, there's a big variety of reasons. But one thing that I found was it highly effective at connecting with students who had, had traditionally had very poor experiences with the educational system was current events. They loved talking about current events. If you could show them a news clip or even bring up on the overhead projector a slide of the front page of the newspaper. Or, you know, I later subscribed to the newspaper and would bring in the daily newspaper and be like, front page of the paper is a story about Bob. Why would Bob be on the front page? And being able to connect what we were seeing today with things that had happened in the past, with You know, like, why is this a story today? Well, here's why. Because in the past, this thing happened. And this is why it matters now. That ended up being that and a few other things. But that is one of the ways that I found that I could get students to connect to the material. Rather than it just being a boring recitation of like, the colonial period was 1750. You know, like, that's boring. Uh, don't make me memorize the dates of the colonial period. I'm not interested in that. If you, if I'm a 16 year old student with law enforcement uh, breathing down my neck to come to school, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but if we can make it about something that is actually happening in the world that might impact their life, then it's a different story. So that just became sort of the foundation of my teaching career. Uh, I went on to teach in the DC area. I taught with, I taught, uh, I co-taught with a special educator. I ended up working a lot with students who had, uh, who received special education services and they were integrated into a general education classroom. But that was that the, they are often students who also have poor experiences with education. They don't feel successful. They don't feel like they can get good grades. They don't feel as Often, I'm not saying this is 100% true, but they often have trouble feeling as successful as their peers. But this entrance, this entry point into talking about history and government has always been very successful for me. 
So uh, it turns out that adult humans are exactly the same. It, tur- it turns out so that you- adult humans are the same as adolescent humans when it comes to learning about topics that they have traditionally found boring. Go and most of us don't know anything either about the government. I think I'd read a few research survey. I mean, you see these surveys come out and it's like 80% of, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. population doesn't, you know, they know nothing about their government, yeah. right? So uh-huh. uh, I think mm-hmm. that, I don't think that it's people don't want to know about their government, no. but it's that they weren't taught in a way that is engaging or that was successful for them. So mm-hmm. I think, and it's very interesting to kind of see your trajectory, right? Because, you know, when you were talking about being a kid and getting these news weeks, I'm thinking of like 11 year old Sharon, you know, is this mm-hmm. outlier? Like, you know, other kids are playing sports mm-hmm. or whatever they're doing in your uh-huh. kind of setting reading about the government and then that kind of escalates and then you're getting the economist and foreign affairs magazines as you're, you know, going into college and then you become a government teacher. And I can really connect the dots in your content and the way that you present yourself in terms of just having this kind of profound empathy, right? Which it seems to me started very young and then kind of transitioned into your working with these kids who a lot of people had given up on, right? And when Mm -hmm. I see you online and the way that you engage with the public, Oh, you, you get into some heated topics, right? And you're still empathetic with people. You're still trying to cultivate a dialogue to where mm. even if people are on polar opposites, right? Black and white, uh, you know, this or that. You're trying to bring people together and, and get them to see that we have something. And if we can only find one in common, we can start mm-hmm. there, right? And mm-hmm. we might not agree on everything, but we can still come together and have a dialogue because that is what mm-hmm. democracy is about. Mm. It's supposed to be about. Somebody doesn't shoot these high ideas. Who will? Because there's already so many people in the echo chambers on either side. So many people, you know, to the extremes. I feel like though there's more people that are within the extremes than those loud voices would have you believe because those are the ones who get the most attention. So what I mean, how has that been for you to kind of be this voice of reason amongst the chaos? I mean, you've been doing this especially, you know, for a while. When the voices were super loud in 2020, uh, you know, just so much extremism online, especially uh, the kind of the Twitter energy um, of things. And the, I mean, how, how has that been for you kind of staying grounded uh, in your ethos, you know, which is mm. to bring people together? You know, it is a skill that I cultivated from years in the classroom. Most good mm-hmm. teachers would rather have students who are able to think critically, but who arrive at a different conclusion than the teacher themselves has arrived at. That is a skill that teachers value, and they would much rather have you write a compelling essay with a thesis that they ultimately disagree with, but that is well proven. They would much rather have that than somebody who is just like regurgitating, parroting some stuff they found on Wikipedia. You know what I mean? Like, that's actually, that's not interesting. So in order to, to create that type of critical thinking in a student group, you have to have differing opinions. You can't think critically if everybody's like, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. It's not critical thinking. In order to be able to critically think about anything, you have to consider other viewpoints. And most Americans today would say, yeah, nobody critically thinks anymore, but most people are unwilling to look in the mirror when it comes to that topic. They're very willing to surround themselves with information they already agree with, and they're too often want their children to only be surrounded with information they agree with. Mm -hmm. And thus, the children do not learn to think critically. They only learn to parrot a list of pre-prescribed thoughts and beliefs that say what the parents or the school or whatever wants them to hear. So it's a skill that I I think is so important uh, to be able to hold space for diverging viewpoints because ultimately that is more valuable to me than getting somebody to be like, yeah, Sharon, I agree with that. Right. I would yeah. much rather have an honest conversation where you have a different opinion than I do, because guess what? I can learn something from that. Even if we disagree, I can learn from that disagreement. I'm not learning anything by you being like, yeah, that's right. 
okay, great. You know what I mean? Uh, if I if I bring you to my way of thinking, that's fine. But ultimately, I feel like I am made better. That that sort of mentality of like iron sharpens iron. If we have a really engaging dialogue about diverging view, viewpoints, that's far more interesting to me intellectually than just people all all echoing the same, you know, the same five talking points. So doing it online mm-hmm. is in some ways very similar to doing it in a classroom, but it's also somewhat different in that in a classroom, yeah. you have the chance to create a classroom community and a classroom culture. As an, as the adults in the room, you're in charge of what happens in the classroom. Mm-hmm. You tell the students what's acceptable and what's not. You enforce the consequences if things are getting out of hand. Um, it's very A classroom is very hierarchical right? I'm in charge. You're not in charge. You are 15, yes. sir. And I'm in charge and you are not, right? Uh, and that's actually how it's supposed to be. Somebody needs to be in charge and it should not be the 15-year-olds. Mm-hmm. That is not the case true. with adults in the wild west of Beyonce's internet. That is not how that yeah. works. Uh, and opinions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And sometimes... I do get the opportunity to really think about things from a new perspective of like, oh, you know what? I had not thought of that. And one of the reasons that I value that so much is because there are people in my community from such a huge variety of different backgrounds. Uh, We're talking about like members of Congress all the way to people who work in, um, you know, who are preschool teachers, you know, people who are like, I'm a dentist. Or I am a, an attorney for the world, you know, Raytheon. The, they're just the, the breadth of experience of people that I would probably never have access to otherwise. Uh, that is super interesting to me. And so I absolutely love having a community that has such a wide range of people. But it also does open you up to not just criticism. I think everybody who's on the public facing on the internet knows that criticism will occur, but it opens you up to literal uh danger th- threats yeah. um how do you deal people, with that because yeah, yeah there's pe- people that don't don't agree politics war, i mean there's wars that people feel so strongly about there's issues that mm-hmm. are affecting people's lives in very powerful ways and you know things that they say don't talk about at the holiday get together because mm-hmm. you might end up in a fist fight with your great uncle right because mm-hmm. like these things are i mean these are our lives at stake you're talking about uh, things that affect us every day. So like, how, how do you deal with like the, the most mm-hmm. negative, right? Because, um, yeah, that can be hard, right? Sometimes there's times I don't even want to deal with the comment section. I mean, I, I like, cause I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not never going to retreat from, because I feel like it's important for me to engage with people to a certain degree, not to where it's going to take me out of my mission or, you know, the integrity of what I'm trying to do, but it, it could, it could be easy to get lost down that, that rabbit hole oh, yeah. of negativity. So Have you faced Mm -hmm. that at all? And how how Mm -hmm. do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's like I, it's like I, you know, I like to bring this up that arguing online is not activism. That's not what real activism is. I'm not saying no activism can exist online. I'm saying arguing in the comments is not activism. I am not going to be 99 on my deathbed being like, dang, I wish I had argued with more strangers on the internet (laughs) that's not that's not gonna be my life regrets right so i try not to get into giant arguments with strangers in the comments section on the internet but when you're talking about legitimate uh threats like last week somebody said to me um when are when is your death so your children can be left orphans uh and then in the they sent me a dm saying that they hope i have my throat slit so wow. we're not where it goes it goes way beyond just you know like you're stupid and ugly. It goes way beyond that into like wishing for somebody's death or telling them that they should kill themselves. That is a di- that see that doesn't happen in your well-ordered classroom. You don't have no, 16 year olds saying that to you. Right. So there that is when it gets to be really really uh challenging. And sometimes you absolutely like the internet does feel vulnerable. It does because you don't know who's watching and you don't know 
you know, like in a classroom, you do know those kids. You can get to know them. You can look up and see like, where does this person live? Who are their parents? But you, I, oh, I had him last year. You can ask your friend, your co teaching colleagues, do you have any ideas about Jermaine? I'm not sure what's going on with him. He hasn't been here in a while. Um, but there are ways that you can address situations. But on the internet, you don't even know who these people are. And so it does feel vulnerable sometimes. Um, and yeah. that can be... That can be very discouraging for people to do this kind of work because the vulnerability feels like it takes such a toll sometimes. Um, and also, you know, I know we've talked about this before, the hate content that is produced on these extreme ends of the political spectrum, the super far right leaning hate content that is full of conspiracy theories and absolutely wackadoodle ideas and the far left hate content that uh, wants to police every word out of your mouth and tell you that you didn't mm -hmm. say it right or you're not talking about X enough. And they're going to these people who have like Instagram accounts about how to bake cookies and telling them that they need to be talking about bald eagles more or, you know, whatever, like things that are like, yeah. what are you even like, this is not my content. I, I make cookies. You know what I mean? Like the the thought yeah. policing uh, on the far left and the conspiracy theories on the far right. Um, that pays. It pays so much money, Jermaine. It is very it discouraging does. how much money they can make. Like I'm talking tens of millions of dollars. I'm not even talking about like a little 1K brand deal. No, no. I'm talking about tens of millions of dollars. Some of the people in these spaces make and it can be very and they don't even believe half of them what they uh you know some of them switch from the left to the right or from the right uh -huh. to the left just to uh -huh. get identity i mean so no they, you only see what they put in front of you right but a lot of these people are just making money or churning out money um yeah. to really tap into people's most basest emotions totally. right uh, yes it's, yeah it's it's hundreds of millions of dollars uh -huh. versus conversations like this versus pages like yours versus my very strong opinions on my page about certain things and i tend to share a more critical history because i feel mm -hmm. that we've gotten a very monumental history we've mm -hmm. gotten the statues we've gotten the presidential libraries but yeah i'm still always trying to be accessible and leave room for dialogue showing anybody willing to have a dialogue but i think that's you know that's rare when you're talking about political things or things to do with history want to connect to the present um you know as you said if you're talking about cookies or something or mm -hmm. you know you're kind of uh you know you're talking about vulnerability and i was thinking like there's some guru out there who would be like vulnerability is your strength right one of those mm -hmm. people who are speaking in generalities you know, really have to so much you know think about that but when you're talking about things where politics are involved it's where you know, things can definitely, it's, it's a different kind of space to navigate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there's responsibility mm -hmm. in that with making sure that you're putting out factual information. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, on, on the one hand, it's, you know, it'd be easier sometimes just to kind of pick this extreme side and just spew out that information. It requires really no thought. It doesn't require that critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Looking in the mirror and examining of yourself and questioning your beliefs and uh, challenging your own presuppositions and assumptions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I don't find a whole lot of examples. <laughs> and I think that's why I resonated so much with your content, because there's not a ton of examples on the Internet. I mean, there's a lot of writers and things that do it, but on sure. the Internet uh, who have, you know, these followings, you know, I'm not saying that's not the norm. Right? It's usually either in this side of period. Yeah, um, totally. You kind of know that as you can oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely. That, And I think that's. You know, my community has be become kind of unique on the internet among because this viewpoint doesn't it, it doesn't pay money in the way that uh, being on the far left or the far right pays money. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not I'm not again I'm not complaining I'm not I'm not saying that you can't earn money on you know in this space I'm just saying like nobody is writing me twenty million dollar check right to be like. Just say that everybody, the, that there's a deep state and they drink the blood of children. Just say that. And then here's a check. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. uh, or whatever it is. Um, 
It is. It's a unique space to be operating in. And I do think that it attracts a certain type of person. But, you know, by and large, it can be very challenging because we have become accustomed to following people who validate our already held beliefs. That is who feels good to follow. You know, you're like your brain gets a little hit of dopamine when somebody says something that you already agree with. You're like, yeah, I agree with that. Like your brain loves that little reward of, of I got it right. I got the question right. I already agree with that. So we are, that has become very cultural that we follow people that have viewpoints that we already agree with. So when I am not saying what people agree with, not when I'm not saying what people already agree with, that makes them, that creates a little bad feeling in their brain where they're like, what? I thought you were better than this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, have you ever, have you ever that. had that I've, experience? I've, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I've, I mean, I think people, you know, I, I'm definitely more of a progressive thinker, but there have been some things that I posted that aren't, you know, they're, they're not in line with this kind of, uh, orthodoxy of you know progressive thought or anything right i'm like Mm -hmm. because i'm always questioning i'm always you know so there's a little more nuance in my views other than just like i know Mm -hmm. jermaine's going to say this like this predictability in you Mm -hmm. know if you're kind of leaning on this farther left or right uh you know platform and mine's more nuanced it's more gray um Mm -hmm. you know but i think there's been some people definitely i've seen in the comments where people are disappointed like i can't believe you didn't say mm-hmm. it this way or you didn't mm-hmm. speak up for this particular thing. Right. But I'm like, no, I'm ever evolving person. I'm a human. I'm learning. I'm not going to agree with everything that you agree with. Uh, you know, hope you still follow me, but you know, if not, that really speaks to your inability to have a dialogue and mm-hmm. I'm old enough where if you don't agree to try to change my mind. I don't hear what you have to say, but mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. to cut somebody off, you know, that's the opposite of the you know, mm-hmm. platform that I'm, trying to create and you actually said something earlier that kind of stuck in my mind when you said that arguing on the internet often gets mistaken for activism Mm -hmm. and that's something i really agree with i think activism it's about tangible change it's about getting out there and making a difference in the real world it's world it's uh, about organizing and mobilizing and arguing on the internet it's usually an echo chamber right it's people venting Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're learning, but it lacks that direct impact, you know, getting out in the street, the community meetings, getting on the front line where real change happens. And so I think, of course, online discourse has its place, but we can't confuse it with the kind of hands on gritty work Mm -hmm. of true activism, the sweat and the tears. You know, that's the real struggle. And I think, uh, you know, something else that I wanted to talk to you about is kind of this, what I would call political hobbyism. You know, people who might donate five bucks, who, you know, get online, argue a little bit, and just kind of just very softly engage. How do we get people, or, you know, are you thinking about this as you're trying to engage your audience? Like, how do we get people to really engage in this kind of democratic experience, uh, experiment and, you know, really get into a more, robust form of of politics, you know, getting off the sidelines, not just throwing that five bucks out Mm -hmm. there and Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, sitting back and watching things from the sidelines. Is that Mm -hmm. something you think about and what Mm -hmm. ways do you engage people in that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to be politically engaged, but I think right now the dominant narrative either is you are into politics and you're an activist and like you said you're going to the meetings and you're doing the organizing and you're going to the marches and the rallies and you're doing the voter signups and you know like all the things you're calling congress you're doing all these all the things Mm -hmm. either you're that person or you're not it's one or the other that's america tends to be a very black and white country Maybe you've yeah. noticed this, Jermaine. Like we, it's all or nothing. You're either Democrat or yeah. Republican. You're either, you know, you are this or that. And the rest of the world, generally speaking, sees things. Uh, and you know, I'm this is broad over generalization, but there's a lot more room for nuance in other cultures. And there are good things about black and white thinking. It, it's decisive. It, you know, America has achieved some cool stuff in part because of our culture. But, um. 
I like to encourage people to think about instead of either assuming the identity of I am a political person, I am an activist, thinking like I either need to be myself or I need to be Fannie Lou Hamer. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. people think it's one or the other. Either I'm dedicating my whole life to this and I'm speaking at the conventions and I'm doing all the things or I work in the emergency department. Either yeah. I teach preschool or I am running for Congress. They think it's either yeah. one of those things. And, and there that is could put so... way high expectations yes. or you don't want to engage because you're like, oh, my God, I can never aspire to that. Just let me sit back right. and kind of kick my feet. You know, I, I'm never going to yes. do that. I can't so, be yeah, so that's discouraging. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It's discouraging if you feel like I can't dedicate my life to doing this. I actually went to college to be a surgeon, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I, I have important work. I approach this from the perspective of everybody has important work to do. And we should not allow ourselves to be distracted from our important work. And some people's important work is being in Congress. And some people's important work is being a teacher. And some people's important work is, you know, working uh, at uh, the social security office. And some people's mm -hmm. important work is working on the internet. We should not allow ourselves to be distracted from our important work because our all of our labor is needed and necessary to improve society. What what good are we if everybody is running for Congress and nobody can do surgery? That's not a society I want to live in, right? Like we need everybody's skills and everybody's important work. And there is one way that everybody can be involved. And there is not one prescribed way. I can't tell you what your specific way to be involved is, but uh, nobody can do everything, but everyone can do something. And chances are that. good that you have, and I'm talking specifically to the listener here, chances are very good that there is a topic that you feel especially passionately about, that there is something that is just like kind of gnaws at you inside. Maybe it's child hunger. Maybe it's education. Maybe it's environmental protection. Maybe you care deeply about civil discourse. Maybe you care really so much about um, making sure that people have, you know, fair housing, access to job training, whatever it is that you feel especially passionately about. I firmly believe that those things are given to you for a reason, that that is the topic that you are meant to have an impact on. Because we're not all FDR, right? We're not all mustering the, mar marshalling the resources of a vast federal government to create mm -hmm. like, let's, let's do this and now this and let's fight the Nazis and let's create jobs. Most of us will never, ever, ever even aspire to be that person. But if we take whatever it is that we feel especially strongly about and we choose that as the thing that we try to move the needle on even just a little bit, that labor is needed and necessary. If you care deeply about mm. making sure that kids have breakfast in the morning or you like they're not going home over the weekend hungry, like they don't go home to food insecurity and you try to move the needle on children in your community, uh, you know, not having food insecurity, nobody should lay their head on the pillow at night being like, well, I didn't do enough. That is actually incredibly important work. That child could then grow up to be somebody who, you know, impacts the world in massive, massive ways. But if we don't help them now, they're not going to grow up to be that person. So that's how I tend to think about encouraging people to engage with the world is don't be distracted from your important work. And the issues that you care about were given to you for a reason. When you feel strongly about something, you are inspired to work on it. And yeah. don't be discouraged that your small actions don't completely wipe out child hunger in a month. Many things require a significant amount of work and struggle to see progress. And don't discount the idea that your contribution is not making progress. 
Sometimes it might take a while to see what your progress is, but if we look back on history and we see the the cumulative concerted struggle and effort of our ancestors, we can now turn back and see like, dang, look at what they achieved. But guess what? It took tens of thousands of people decades yeah. to achieve that. We, we need to let go of this idea that it's like one great man or woman who's going to come save us. No, no, that is not how it works, right? Yes, we can look back That's and be how like- history was taught for a long time. The great man yes. theory, this whole theory, the great man theory of history, you know, just this one guy, this one president, this one mm -hmm. uh, warrior who rose up from the ranks and, uh, you know, spread the empire you know that that and mm -hmm. you know i think people resonate to that but it's again what we talked about about just having such high aspirations if you reach anything below that you feel like you're not doing anything mm -hmm. at all and so uh yeah that's uh not a good way to to look at things i don't think no and then what it does is if we know that like okay well i'm an i'm a nurse i'm not i'm not the next president i'm not interested in that right it it almost allows us to just sort of like check out check out and not feel mm -hmm. like we need to be part of the solution because we're not the great man in air quotes yes. or great woman that the world's waiting for i'm no martin luther king like i mm -hmm. hate like what if somebody's like i have ma ma such massive social anxiety i could never even introduce myself in a class i couldn't even say two fun facts in sixth grade mm -hmm. you know what i mean uh so i can never be that person um if we allow ourselves to always wait for somebody else to fix it, then we are not contributing to the progress of humanity. And we all and you have talked an about, important role to play. You talked about important work, and I just kind of want to go back to that because I've been amazed by your philanthropy as, as a part of your platform. And, you know, you're raising millions of dollars. You're changing so many lives. Uh, you know, you talked about being a teacher. My parents are teachers and we know that that is a career that is noble in intent but it's lacking in zeros and mm -hmm. so you're helping teachers with these teacher grants and i just want to know is there a particular story that deeply moved you or maybe even brought you to tears like you know in, in this philanthropy work that you're doing mm -hmm. so many of them i mean i'm moved to tears regularly and it is really vulnerable to cry on the internet because you know that there are people out there taking screenshots of your sad face and making fun of you behind your back. You know what I mean? Uh, you know yeah, that's like happening. Out of you like a <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But that's what I mean by refusing to be distracted from your important work. If I allowed you know, myself to just spend all my time worrying about if I'm going to be a, a crying face meme, then, uh, then I wouldn't be able to do the work that is important. So there have been... There was one woman in particular. We've raised over $9 million in the last uh, three years for a variety of things. There's one woman in particular who... That's, that's oh, a beautiful thank thing. You. Thank you. Uh, one woman who, whose co-worker, uh, she had a co-worker who was in her 60s, and the co-worker had cancer and had gone through cancer treatment, and they worked at Starbucks. This woman was in her 60s working at Starbucks, and... As a result of her cancer treatment, she had lost most of her teeth mm. and so wore a mask at work, even when it wasn't a requirement to do so, to hide the fact that she didn't have teeth. And your insurance is probably not going to pay for that. Uh, we could we could spend a whole separate podcast talking about the issues with dental dental coverage in the United States. It's not like it's how the how dentistry became separate from medicine is a very very interesting topic that we don't have time for today. But chances are good there is nobody who is able and willing to just pay for that for you. You might be able to get dentures, but they're still expensive, right? And um, they may or may not work for your specific situation. So we were able to. Um, raise money to help this specific woman fix her smile so that she felt like she could participate normally in society. She felt removed from society. She felt like she couldn't be a normal person at a workplace. And also she felt like she couldn't retire. She was in her 60s working at Starbucks because she didn't have the resources to even fix 
fix her, you know, her own dental issues. So yeah, that's the type of thing that like the woman uh, being able to, that, that is life changing for somebody. It's way more than um, just, I paid this bill, which can really change somebody's life, of course. Um, but we all know how important being able to interact with another person, look in somebody's eyes, smile at them, speak normally, how important that is, that human connection. It's so important for us. And we don't, I don't even think any of us, unless we've been through the situation, can understand what it meant to this person to be able to have that issue that nobody else was going to address for her, to be able to have that addressed. I will never forget that story of the woman who nominated her coworker for help. And this, you know, this woman was such a, everybody loved working with her. She was kind of this grandmotherly figure. And the Starbucks employees didn't have enough money to pay for this situation um, because it's a lot of money. But collectively, a million people do, right? And so that yeah. is the that's the that's the beauty of uh, doing thing doing the kind of work that I do is you can give five dollars to something that you then feel directly improves somebody's life, and you can see the type of collective impact that together we can have. And I don't want people to just think about that monetarily, although that is important. But that collectively, that's also the type of change we can make when it comes to government, you know, societal progress, that your small, your $5 can help this woman, but also your small amounts of activism in your community, all of our, all of our efforts aggregated do make a big difference. And it's a, it's a very tangible yeah. illustration of that. Yeah. I want to, uh, and that's a beautiful story. And I think, uh, again, that speaks to how you've been able to deploy your empathy. You know, you're doing it on a smaller scale for so long in the classroom. And now that you have this large following, you're able to kind of deploy that and say, hey, you all join in this with me. You know, we have these people who could really use our help. It's mobilized. It kind of goes to that, you know, I talked about political hobbyism in terms of somebody throwing five dollars out there. You know, thinking that is enough but sometimes i mean it speaks to your point that that is enough right if other people collectively are doing that that That's can right. turn into a whole lot of money that can help a whole lot of people or help a few people in a very major way and i appreciate that about you and what you've been able to do but i do want to switch gears just a little bit because i would be mad at myself if i let you leave here and didn't talk about at least a little bit of history because you mm -hmm. are a fellow history lover and mm -hmm. you have this amazing docu series on your podcast, I've listened to some of your Mayhem the 1970s, You Never Knew series, and you know, you got this backdrop of the Vietnam War and civil rights struggles, and you know, it's a time in American history where there's this collective cry for justice and equality, and it's reaching a crescendo, and there's these societal rifts and rich activism, and I just kind of want to know for you, what is a story? or some things you've learned about the 1970s that surprised you or shocked you or uh, you were like, wow, I didn't know this one. There's so much. Oh, my gosh. I mean, maybe you experienced this when you were in high school, too, or college, that um, the 70s tend to really be glossed over in history curriculum because we spend so much time talking about the Civil War in first semester and so much time talking about World War II in second semester. You know, two worthy topics, of course, but we just don't, we kind of run out of time. Maybe we get up through um, the Voting Rights Act in the 60s. Yeah. And then like, it, now it's May. We just, we yeah. kind of run out of time to talk about the 70s, which yeah. were an extremely consequential decade. And one of the things I come back to all the time are the Pentagon Papers. Where I am just like, you have got to be kidding me. I, Tell the me Pentagon more because I haven't heard of this. Okay. So the United States has, was involved in Vietnam for a very long time before we even really let people know that we were involved in Vietnam, right? Our involvement in Vietnam goes back to um, the 1950s. And we were not uh, directly fighting a war uh, yet, but JFK was, you know, involved in Vietnam. And we were kind of keeping it under wraps. We were uh, lying to people about what we were involved in in Vietnam. 
Well, once the Vietnam War really started heating up and the tide of public opinion began to turn against involvement in Vietnam, where the draft was taking, you know, tens of thousands of young men to Vietnam to fight for a cause that many of them did not feel was a valiant one. They they felt like, uh, why am I going to Vietnam to fight against communism when this does not represent any kind of existential threat to the United States? You know, I, I don't think you can argue that Hitler was not an existential threat to the United States. He was. And so, you know what I mean? Uh, he, he was never going to stop. At what he you know, he was never going to be like, well, I, you know, I got the Netherlands. That's all I needed. Mm-hmm. No, Hitler was an existential threat to the United States. But it's really difficult to make an argument that North Vietnam was an existential threat to the United States. That's so, true. so many people, my dad included, went to Vietnam. My dad enlisted in the Marines when he was 17 years old. Okay. 17 years old, did two tours in Vietnam in the Marine Corps, which is the, you know, they're the the dudes, they are the boots on the ground in Vietnam. They are the people, you know, uh, getting dysentery in the jungle. That's literally who they are. Um, my dad later died of his combat-related illness from Agent Orange exposure in Vietnam. So uh, what we were asking people to do was... Uh, truly, the American public was unprepared to hear. They were unprepared to hear the types of orders that that these 17-year-old boys were being given. Things like um, take out this entire village, including the women and children. Um, kill them all and light the entire thing on fire. Um, that those are the types of orders that we were being given, and in 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 part because it was very much guerrilla warfare. The Viet Cong did not have clearly marked uniforms, where it was very unlike the unlike Germany, where it was very easy to see who we're fighting. Like we're going to line up our tanks here, you line up your tanks there. We're going to send in some airplanes. We're going to shoot at each other. We're going to have some boats. You know, like World War II was very well defined in terms of who are we fighting, who is the enemy. It really seemed like a, a fight against evil. That's how it seemed. And so when people came home and they had the ticker tape parades and, you know, like it seemed like we truly had done the job of liberators, whereas that was not the case when it came to Vietnam. Well, to make a long story short, Jermaine, uh, they, the Pentagon commissioned a report of the entire U.S. history, U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And they commissioned this report, um, you know, specifically, they wanted this little committee of people and specifically this one man to work on it. And he did. He worked on it. It morphed into this 900 page long history of the United States involvement in, in Vietnam, including all of the ways that the U.S. government had lied to the American public. All of the ways that the uh, CIA had been involved, et cetera. Well, eventually, um, it became clear that the government was going to, you know, was never going to release uh, these papers, that it was meant to be, it, they were classified, uh, that nobody was ever going to see the, you know, these were not going to see the light of day. Um, and there was one man in particular who felt like, I cannot let that happen. I cannot uh, let all of this work uh, just go to waste. And that that man was a man named Daniel Ellsberg, who then decided, mm-hmm. I am going to surreptitiously make a copy of this 900-page document, documents, plural, Um he enlisted the help of his children and like went to the op- the office building of a buddy and they're like secretly making copies of the Pentagon papers uh and his kids are like helping to staple and they're they're trimming off the classified designation at the top of the papers and he contacts the New York Times and says i have some things you might be interested in and it takes the New York Times a while 
to vet, is this guy serious? Is this real? It takes them a while to decide like, we're actually, yeah, we're going to start running, uh, running a report on, uh, on the Pentagon Papers. And eventually they did. They began publishing these, what were classified documents in the New York Times. And let me tell you, Richard Nixon, not happy. Richard Nixon, not happy that the New York Times is publishing what looks like negative information about the United States government. Most of the information was not even about Richard Nixon. You know, like he he was not the primary decision maker in the multiple decades leading up to Vietnam. Yes, he was the vice president for a while, but not the, most of the Pentagon Papers actually don't even implicate him. But he nevertheless did not like that this was, you know, being published and that it was making the U.S government look bad. So he actually, um, again, I don't want to, I don't want to take too long telling this story, but this case, he told the New York Times, you need to, we're going to sue you. You need to stop publishing this stuff. It went to the Supreme Court. And this, and the lo long story short, multiple dozens of newspapers get in on this as a, as an injunction came down to say you stop publishing these classified documents another newspaper would step up here comes the washington post being like we'll take the next installment uh the and as as these as an injunction would come down saying you stop publishing these papers another newspaper would step up and uh, wow. publish the next installment and so this went around to more than a dozen newspapers publishing the pentagon papers well daniel ellsberg in an effort to shut him up the Nixon administration sent the CIA to break into the office of his of his psychiatrist in an effort to try to dig up dirt on him that they could try to blackmail him with. Of if we could yeah, get Nixon his was known for that. Yes, if he could get get his patient records, then we could say, oh, he's being treated for depression. He's being treated for mental illness. This guy's crazy. We can try to discredit him. We can say to him, stop doing this, or we're going to release your, uh, you know, psych psychiatric records. Ultimately, Daniel Ellsberg finds out that when he is speaking at a an event, that the CIA had plans to assassinate him. And ultimately, they did not end up going through with it for a variety of reasons, but he has remained a very vocal critic. And I won't tell you everything that happened when it comes to the Pentagon Papers, because again, it's a long story. But that to me is an example of when people are like, well, the government has never been more corrupt. It's never been more terrible. I'm, you know, I, all you got to do is point to Richard Nixon and it goes far, far, far beyond Watergate, yeah. which was a separate issue than, than breaking into sending the CIA. There was a separate story altogether. So yeah, he tried to dig up dirt on uh, Shirley Chisholm too, I think. Oh yes. Uh, if I remember I was yep. writing about that in he, my book. So he's, he's really using the government in this way as uh, an extension of his nefarious purposes. I mean, you had the colluding with the milk lobby and, you know, all these things that cover, yeah. not only cover his own tracks, but to discredit people. Um, yeah, so it's like a worst case scenario of how mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't have the best interests of the American people at heart in power and the extent mm -hmm. that they can use them to shut people mm -hmm. up or even, you know, that they, I mean, this guy was about to be killed, right? So, I mean, it goes mm -hmm. very deep and disturbing mm -hmm. look at you know, how power can can be corrupted and used, especially if you will the power, you know, US government. So that's a mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a story to raise your eyebrows for sure. <laughs> it definitely is. Uh and again, that is a super duper high, high, high level overview of what the about what the Pentagon Papers was. But that's just one story of the types of things yeah. that were happening in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, I think the one uh, I watched this documentary the other day, and this is kind of more counterculture. I don't know if you've seen it. it's on Netflix. It's called Wild Wild Country. It's insane. Mm -hmm. It's uh, dives into the story of this guru. His name is Osho, and his followers take over this small town in Oregon. It's not just some kind of peaceful hippie community. It's like a full-on cult scenario, and they start mm -hmm. busing in homeless people to manipulate local elections so that they can kind of take over like the politics mm -hmm. of this town. And 
you know, it's kind of like to me a microcosm of just the craziness of the 70s, kind of dialed up to 11, right? And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, this group has their own armed security force, like a private army, right? You know, small town America. So the people of the town are freaking out. Like, there's all these people are coming in from, you know, all across the nation by the thousands. And the manipulation, you know, within this code is off the charts because this is a very charismatic leader and, and he's at the heart of it all. And, you know, there's so bad jump of free love and then it spirals into this platform attacks and why it's happening. I mean, it's all this stuff is there yeah. in the story of power and control and people seeking mm. this utopia. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and just the, the wild, wild country is the name of the documentary, but it's kind of like mm-hmm. the wild, wild 70s, right? There's so many of these yes. different stories um, that you can find. So I think uh, you kind of tapped into something with your uh, like, let's go ahead and do this uh, docu-series on the 70s. Mm-hmm. I feel like you could do like a hundred episodes if you wanted to. And just to- totally. Keep this we going, could do going 12 on episodes just on the Pentagon Papers. I mean, like, it's such a, it's such a crazy story that the vast majority of people did not learn about. And if you're, if you were, let's say a teenager in the seventies, you were probably not paying careful attention. You know, like that was, maybe you probably didn't hear about it that much. Maybe you recognize the name Daniel Ellsberg, but it's not like, really bringing a lot to mind that this is what we hear so much of like, I had no idea, or it rang a very faint bell, but I, I was busy doing other things at the time. And I was not paying careful attention to what was going on with the Nixon administration. Yeah. Well, I could, I could talk to you all day. I know we got to start coming to a close, but I, mm-hmm. I have a question I have to ask because you talk a lot about presidents. Uh, you have a series that I watched on Andrew Jackson, which was mm-hmm fascinating but i, I want to know for you who is your goat president your greatest of all time mm. president mm. i mean i here's the thing people always ask this question and i feel like everyone is obligated to say say lincoln right because he achieved incredible things consequential things that continue to matter today and so that is i mean there's no question that lincoln is right up there amongst the uh, the greatest presidents of all time. But here's something that I think that a lot of people don't think about Lincoln is that um, Lincoln, when it came to, um, you know, he he definitely made some mistakes, especially when it came to Native Americans. He's not a flawless human being. There's no president that we can look back and be like, flawless, 10 out of 10. You know, like we're all, we're, we, they're definitely, especially when it comes to uh, Native American issues, things that yeah. Lincoln did wrong. There uh, were things when it came to some of his ideas about colonization of like, you know what? The emancipated slaves can't just live amongst us. Maybe we should try recolonizing other mm-hmm. places and send them there. Uh, you know, there are some ideas today that would be like, mm, that's real problematic, buddy. You know, th- things of that nature. But what, of course, he achieved some really, really consequential But one of the things that I think is interesting about him, number one, is that the Republican Party was extraordinarily progressive. We think about today the Republican Party being conservative. Uh, But Mm -hmm. if you think about progressivism being this concept of wielding the power of the federal government to improve the lives of citizens, if that is the uh, model of progressivism, if that's like what we think of LBJ, wielding the power of the federal government. That is what the new Republican Party was doing. Imagine today any political party being like, listen, uh, y'all owning all these guns is bad news. You can't own them anymore. We're going to take them away from you. Imagine a government uh, taking away somebody's what they viewed as private property, uh, Mm -hmm. enslaved people, taking away uh, enslaved people and saying, you can't own this anymore. And your entire manner of livelihood is now no longer going to exist. That is radical societal change. That is, uh, it, it, that is power that no president has wielded since, uh, in an effort to improve lives, uh, improve lives of citizens. So that to me is always very interesting to think about exactly how progressive we're talking here. But one of the other things I think is interesting is during the Civil War, you know, we we recruited a lot of mercenaries to fight in fight for the Union. We went to Europe and we were like, Hungarians, get in here. We can use your help. Germans, Scottish, Canadians, what, who you got? We need a, we need assistance over here. And I think it's really interesting that 
Lincoln uh, allowed for a very high degree of pluralism inside the Union Army. Um, if people were, you know, observed kosher dietary restrictions, that was acceptable. If they needed to have Saturdays off for religious observance instead of Sundays, that was acceptable. There was not this sense of everybody needs to be a Protestant Christian, you guys. Okay? That's how we roll mm -hmm. here in the United States. Protestant Christians only. Um, he was very tolerant uh, of a variety of religious practices, cultural practices. And again, I'm not saying he did everything right and gets A pluses on everything, but I think that's an aspect of his leadership that is overlooked today, that his respect for pluralism um, is something that we we don't often see. I, I don't often see that talked about. Yeah, I'd have to say Lincoln too. And uh, for me, it's because it's a study in deep contradictions, but also this idea of a life of transformation. As you said, I mean, that he had uh, the Corn Amendment where he was almost willing to perpetuate slavery forever. You had the execution of the Dakota Sioux. Uh, you had his racist views that you could speak to. All stains on his record. But for me, it's about this remarkable metamorphosis, right? His moral evolution is what I look at. that leads to the emancipation of millions that strikes a chord in my heart. And then he's steering the government. I mean, come on, we're talking about, of course, the civil wars. 620,000 or so deaths. I mean, this is, uh, what is it, the Revolutionary War, World War One, Two, Korean War, like Spanish War, all combined within this mm -hmm. war on American soil. And like, can you imagine the stress, right? You see those pictures of Lincoln where he goes into office and he's looking like this kind of sprightly young uh, lawyer. And then he comes out, he's looking just like, you know, he's the father. Mm -hmm. And then so, even though I curate a more critical history, I always try to remember that it's not like a blunt instrument. Right? It's not chemotherapy to, to destroy everything in your path, right? You can critique Lincoln with precision, but also recognizing the capacity mm -hmm. for the growth, the capacity for redemption, and that is how we can also see ourselves in the story. Mm -hmm. I think that, unfortunately, we've seen like this big shift from this very monumental history, this statuesque history where you can't say anything negative against people to now it's very, very, very critical to the point where people won't recognize the, uh, you know, the, the better parts of Lincoln, you know, the, the contributions they made. Yes. Um, yeah. The contributions right. that he made. Yeah. Right. So I'm always trying to be careful that I don't fall into that trap mm -hmm. uh, myself. And, you know, that's definitely, I, I, again, I cultivate somewhat of a critical history, but Lincoln's always kind of my example that I use of like, you know, he's a flawed human being, uh, but in some ways he was able to rise above his times. I mean, in a lot of ways he was able to rise above his times because if he only went with the times, you know, he just went along with his views that he had in the beginning and he wouldn't yeah. have transformed over time. Right. He was also willing to risk incredible unpopularity. He was willing to be unpopular. And that is assassination, you know, even. Yeah. I mean, his views that he had so many. I mean, of course, he got assassinated, but even before that, you know, assassination attempts. Mm -hmm. Many whole, assassination uh, cabal, attempts. A cabal yes. against him. Yes. You know, obsessed with assassinating him. him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, willing to be tremendously unpopular, facing incredible home life difficulties, you know, like the death of his son. His wife is has severe mental illness. And is not seen in public for years and spends all her time upstairs at the White House talking to their dead son. Um, you know, he himself was prone to such depression. Uh, I, I'm sure you you know this, that there were letters that he wrote to his friends being like, please come over and take the knives out of the house or I'm going to use them on myself. He had mm -hmm. tremendous mental health issues himself, like the, the depression that he suffered from. Uh, and I think that also, to me, makes it. Um, even, of course, I'm sad that his child died, et cetera. I would never wish that on anybody, but it, it makes his personal transformation even more noteworthy that in, you know, in, in, a, in spite of his incredible depression, in spite of 
the death of his child, in spite of his wife's serious mental health issues, in spite of his unpopularity, in spite of people constantly trying to kill him, you know, in, in spite, in spite, in spite, in spite, he still had the moral courage to do what he felt was the right thing. And so many of us Beautiful. would have just taken our ball and gone home. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I was trying to think in terms of ending this, a quote that kind of I feel like applies to you and reminded me of this quote that says, the difference between patriotism and nationalism is that the patriot is proud of their country for what it does and the nationalist is proud of their country no matter what it does. Mm. Food creates a feeling of responsibility, the second a feeling of blind arrogance. And I think mm. that your approach to engaging people with politics, government, and the fabric of America, I find truly inspiring. I think that you're not just educating, but you're cultivating that sense of responsibility, of accountability, of understanding. And I think it's a love of America rooted in what it does and not a blind allegiance. And so I think your work then Thank fosters you. a true patriotism and informed and thoughtful connection uh, that encourages active and responsible citizens. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you. your work That's so much. Everything that praise. you do. Thank you. That, That's that, very that, high well praise earned. coming from it's you. Well mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank I appreciate you. you coming on the show, Sharon. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. All right. Well, we will see you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Do you need